Hello, thank Parliament. you. Um, it's truly an honor to be here with all of you. There's so many familiar faces and um, all of you in the front row have motivated me and Janice and David, um, thank you very much for including me. So um, if you guys are here today, you're intimately aware of the dangerous and pivotal time in our history. Uh, I began using social media in 2014 to report on issues suppressed, ignored, mostly by our established media. I tackle subjects ranging from the manufactured refugee crisis, from Islamic terrorism and covert jihadist and communist organizations infiltrating the West, to the insidious human rights violations taking place in Muslim-dominated countries. My main goal has been to give Americans an insight into what is taking place in the international political arena. In general, Americans remain unaware of the patriotic parties and candidates challenging the hard left leadership across Europe. They're shielded from a truly complicit media. Americans lack the knowledge about the individuals and the parties challenging Angela Merkel's government the existence of the multiple parties fighting for freedom in the UK, and most Americans have never heard of Viktor Orban in Hungary or Jay Bolsonaro in Brazil, and most are certainly unaware of the control the European Union is exerting. Importantly, I fight to expose the tactics deployed by the hard left media to instruct those who have dared to question the narrative. People like freedom fighters from Geert Wilders to Oriana Falaci to Bat Yor to Dr. Wafa Sultan to Marine Le Pen, who've relentlessly been vilified and smeared with labels such as xenophobe, racist, Islamophobe, far right, or Nazi. Politicians like Wilder, who dare to challenge Islam, are now forced to live under police protection and in safe houses. How many citizens in a court country are forced to hire security after they've criticized Christians or Jews? Europe is starting to resemble an Islamic country living under Sharia. After some time, social media users in Europe started sending me messages about how they were being targeted in their communities. They were being labeled as extremists. They were being blocked from posting their opinions about the effects of migration. European Jews would tell me how they feared for living for their safety because they were being, openly, they were, they were being flooded with openly anti-Semitic migrants pouring into their countries. Christians would tell me they no longer speak freely about their religion, and yet they were being forced to brace Islam. Throughout Europe, people's individual freedoms and liberties were being lost, and their safety was being threatened. They feared for their children's future, and they, they, they no longer recognized the countries they loved. Communist and Islamic supremacists had once again formed an unholy alliance known as the Red-Green Axis in an effort to destroy their enemy, their common enemy that is, Western culture and judeo christian values. These enemies of freedom were importing waves of economic migrants from third world nations into Europe. These migrants had little interest in assimilation into Western laws, traditions, and cultures. Radicals use migrants to tear down the fabric of sovereign nations and to vote the left into a permanent majority. Based on the success that these communists and these Islamic supremacists were having in Europe, I knew the tactics that they would deploy in America. I did not, however, anticipate that members and allies of the hard left violent groups such as Antifa would be employed as journalists working for major news organizations in America. These so-called reporters would use dangerous communist tactics, engaging in threats, smears, stalking, putting people's lives in jeopardy, going after families, going after children, bankrupting all of those who exposed the dangers of mass migration and violent jihad. I realized that Europe was a precursor for what they were going to try in America, but I did not realize that they were going to take these tactics to an even lower and a more horrific level. I certainly never thought that I and my loved ones would be the first case where the radical left media would try to silence my voice by attacking my family members and anyone associated with me. I did not realize that working on a grassroots level to uncover the assaults on freedom taking, across, taking place across the world was now going to put all of my family members in fear for their lives. Sorry. 
and I certainly did not realize that my family member's ability to earn a living would now be greatly hindered because I dared to challenge the anti-Semitic and hateful verses of the Quran. I certainly did not realize that I, as a Jewish woman, would now be labeled as an alt-right white nationalist or a white supremacist Nazi because I dared to endorse Donald Trump for president of the United States. The media first turned their attention to me in 2015 when candidate Donald Trump had retweeted and put out my work several times. I was future, featured in a New York Times article about women who also supported Donald Trump for president. Then candidate Donald Trump appealed to me because he was the first candidate to challenge the globalist agenda. He was the first person to speak of putting America first and to challenge the jihadist threat. And most importantly, Donald Trump understood the importance of America's borders. At the time of the New York Times article, I kept my identity private. I felt that I was receiving enough credible threats for covering the um, threats of ISIS and for Islamic terrorism, that the more my work became more influential, the more threats and more negative media attention I received. I was labeled first by the media as a Russian bot, someone who was not real and someone who was actually employed by the Russian government. From the European to American media, there were dozens and dozens of articles calling me a foreign fabrication. They could not understand how an American woman could be Jewish, conservative, a human rights activist, an animal activist, a vegan, a pro-Second Amendment, fight for mass incarceration, against mass incarceration, help the wrongfully imprisoned, and be a therapist. I broke their stereotype of what and who could be a conservative, and most importantly, a Trump supporter. I was dangerous to them, and because of this, I had to be discredited and destroyed. I realized that they reached a new level of hysteria, when Jake Tapper, a well-known CNN anchor, began telling his audience on social media that I was nothing but a foreign fabrication, a Russian bot. Imagine my shock when a news program featured a 30-minute segment with four national reporters from various mainstream news agencies discussing how I was a Russian bot. Or when NBC had their so-called counterterrorism reporter make the ludicrous, ludicrous claim that I was working for the Russians. In the summer of 2017, my Twitter was banned in Germany and France. This sent a chill down my spine because this was not the first time in history a Jewish woman with a dissenting voice was banned in Germany or France. The mainstream media never addressed my reports, opting instead to discredit me with bizarre and unfounded smears. But still I persisted. I wore those, those attacks as a badge of honor, secure in my knowledge that warning Americans about the very real and growing threats to the West was necessary. In April 2018, the attacks took a terrifying turn. The counterterrorism NBC reporter, who previously claimed I was working for the Russians, began sending me direct messages claiming he had discovered my identity and proceeded to send me information about myself and my family members. I ignored his messages at first, but then I asked him to not put my life in jeopardy by making my identity known. I continuously would post the threats I would receive to prove to all of the reporters how my life was in jeopardy. And I was just an average citizen. I'm not being paid for my reporting, and I couldn't afford around-the-clock protection. When people tell me they're going to show up to my home and kill me and then post pictures of my house and my family members, this terrifies me. I naively believed on a very human level that these leftist reporters working for major news organizations would not want me endangered. Instead, I would plead with people like this NBC reporter to focus on my message, and I'd be more than happy to debate him on the issues. Then, in May 2018, I began receiving phone calls and emails from a reporter at the Huffington Post. I could not understand how this person had my personal email or my private cell phone number because I go to great lengths to keep things very private. Something felt different about how this man had, he had a very threatening tone. I ignored his emails, I ignored his calls. Then this man sent emails to my husband at his place of employment, claiming to know his wife's identity and seeking a comment. 
To give you a little understanding of my husband, his parents are legal immigrants who came to America with third grade educations. They never took a handout in their life and they raised four amazing men who all have successful careers. My husband was living the American dream that every legal immigrant strives for. His parents worked seven days a week in factories and fruit stands to afford to move their family to the suburbs for a better school system. My husband put himself through college, through business school, and through law school. He's somebody who's never been involved in politics. My husband's gone to great lengths to keep his views and his political opinions very private. The irony is that many of his political views are actually quite different than mine. Even though my husband was never politically inclined, he became a target based solely on his proximity to me. After the reporter contacted my husband, I subsequently learned that people in my personal life and my work life were also being harassed by this reporter. Not only was he now contacting people in my life, but he began combing through all of the personal lives of people who are in any way associated with me to try to get them to speak. As a social worker, people come to me with some of their most vulnerable struggles and mental illnesses. This reporter went so far as to contact those dealing with trauma and stress and persistently hounded them for a statement. What I didn't realize at this time was that my home and all of my personal movements were being watched and those of my family members were being watched. Nor did I realize that my private computer had been hacked, either by this reporter or by someone supplying him with information. Things grew terrifying when my husband alerted me he was terminated from his very successful career. Prior to this, my husband had only received the most flattering reviews and accolades for his work. He was terminated because of the repeated contacts by this reporter and foreign influences. As much as I would like to divulge of actually what transpired and the horrific details, I can't speak on it because of legal considerations. At this point, you have to understand, I had no idea what this reporter was about to write. I had no idea what he had said to my husband's employer. Days after my husband's termination, I received more correspondence from my stalker. This time, he sent 11 specific statements and asked me to comment on each. These statements were so outrageous and shocking, nothing more than a trap to get me to divulge more information that this man couldn't find on his own. I had never dealt with anything like this before. I went directly to the public via social media and I informed them of what happened to my husband and all of the threats I was receiving. At this time, I did not realize that this unethical Huffington Post journalist targeting me, a private citizen, comes from a long line of powerful and notorious operatives for America's Democratic Party. In fact, his grandfather was the former chair of the Democratic National Committee and run, ran the presidential campaign of Lyndon B. Johnson. His grandfather's obituary was published in the New York Times, which emphasized the late operatives' beliefs that elections are won never by taking the high road. In addition, this Huffington Post reporter's father is currently an influential Democratic lobbyist. I refuse to name this Huffington Post reporter's name because that's what my stalker is craving, attention and fame. Following the release of my statement on social media, the Huffington Post stalker emailed me saying, quote, you are a clever little troll. That night his smear piece was released in the Huffington Post, a hard left media outlet owned by the American telecommunications company Verizon. This anti-Semitic reporter sought out Ibrahim Hooper, from the Council of American Islamic Relations, CARE, and asked him for a quote about me. Hooper referred to me as, quote, a major cog in the Islamophobia machine, end of quote. CARE has been identified as an organization established by the US Muslim Brotherhood's Palestinian Committee, which is Hamas in America. Hamas openly calls for the destruction of Israel and the death of Jews. CARE has received funds from other Hamas entities and organizations affiliated with Al-Qaeda. In fact, a document retrieved from CARE's headquarters reveals internal discussions at CARE to support Osama bin Laden. This is who is saying a quote about me, a Jew. 
The article immediately went viral and was picked up by reporters from the mainstream media outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, Vice, The Guardian, New York Times, Yahoo, BuzzFeed, Politico, Daily Beast, Associated Press, the list goes on, and by many major leftist Hollywood figures. The media pylon forever poisoned the page one Google results of me and my family members and now falsely branded each of us with labels like Nazi. Not one of these media corporations ever, oops, <laughs> Not one of these media corporations even attempted to contact me personally. The article named the location of my parents' home and my business and their business, as well as my brother and his wife's home and business locations. Within a few hours of publication, the threats to my parents' home began. Protesters showed up at my family's work and security had to be hired. The hit piece was so vile that not only was I receiving threats from jihadists and from Antifa, but Nazis were celebrating. The number one Nazi publication in America offered this Huffington Post anti-Semitic Antifa reporter a job. They celebrated. The allegations in these articles were so personal and egregious that I was not really sure how to handle it. By defending myself publicly from his heinous claims, it would only give my stalker and those trying to harden me more ammunition. Out of 44,000 of my tweets, he cherry-picked a few and presented them out of context and claimed I called for the death of Muslims instead of the ISIS terrorists who were slaughtering Christians. He claimed I was an uneducated woman who had never worked. Meanwhile, I hold two master's degrees from a prestigious university in America and have worked my entire adult life. This anti-Semitic reporter took the charitable work my husband and I have done for the wrongfully convicted and their families for prison reform for minorities and animal rights and tried to vilify, pervert, and harm our work. He put all of the people we help who we believe are sitting wrongfully and convicted in prison right now in jeopardy by painting me as somebody who hates Muslims, he put a target on each of their backs. He labeled me as a Nazi, a white supremacist. Clearly, as we've discussed, I'm a Jewish woman. He published hacked materials from my organization's unpublished website that I had been building for two years. He boasted about having my husband fired. He mocked my physical appearance. Childhood friends I knew for three decades ago were being contacted for comments about me. Using the resources of the Huffington Post, he scoured every part of my life. There was not a part of my life he did not try to violate and shame. This stalker even admitted in his article that he had people watching our home, watching us. He went so far as to report on the dry cleaning my husband had in the back seat of his car the very day before the article went live. We were being hunted. This reporter's only named source was a woman struggling with substance abuse issues who tried to break into my family's home. He used an intruder to attribute completely fabricated and vile statements about me. So everyone here should be on notice that if there is somebody who wants to endanger your family, who wants to harm their careers, or who has any kind of personal gripe against you, all they have to do is contact a leftist media in America who is looking to, to silence you, and they will clue to destroy you. Once this article was published, certain media outlets were not satisfied. They, be call they began calling for my loved ones to denounce me, to isolate me, to cut me off, to disown me, or they would come after them next. The hard left media followed Rule 13 from socialist activist Saul Alinsky's book, Rules for Radicals, where he quoted, quote, pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Cut off the support network and isolate the target from sympathy. Go after people, not institutions. People hurt faster than institutions, end of quote. If you are in any way associated with me, whether through a prof prof uh, professional relationship, friendship, by being married to me, by being my mother, my father, or my, my sibling. If you had anything to do with me, you are now held accountable for all of my thoughts, all of my opinions, and all of my reporting.
I will never forget watching the producer of the famous American comedian Ellen DeGeneres show seek out my brother and encourage him to denounce me and promise to reward him by dining at his restaurant. There was an outcry of support and outrage by patriots and grassroots bloggers across the world who followed my work for years. People were rightfully terrified that this could happen to them and their families. Most mainstream conservatives, however, remained silent, perhaps worried that they too would become targets or too frightened to touch subjects like Islamic terrorism. While mainstream media conservatives are concerned about being labeled politically incorrect, the hard left is busy calling all of us white supremacists, Nazis, fascists, and other horrific labels. The silence by the mainstream conservative media has allowed the Yellow Vest protesters in France to be painted as radicals. They've allowed Trump supporters to be labeled as Nazis, and they've allowed citizens marching against the flood of mass migration in their countries to be labeled as far right. The common person speaking out against evil is left standing alone, while mainstream conservative media ignorantly believes that their silence is going to somehow protect them. Too often, conservatives are more interested in conserving themselves and their reputations than they are willing to put themselves on the line and stand shoulder to shoulder with others. This mentality will destroy us. We are at war with a toxic ideology, and we are worried about ourselves. I've come here today to Europe because so many of you have reached out to me. And I know the attacks each of you have faced in your own lives. If we don't form coalitions amongst ourselves and stand together for free speech and all of our individual freedoms, we will lose this war. To recap, a journalist with the resources of Verizon hunted me and stalked my family. My husband was terminated from his successful career for being married to me. A smear piece was published giving readers a false window into the intimate details of my life. The article's main source was a woman who tried to break into my home. The mainstream media picked up the story and used it to further smear me, calling me vicious names. My friends and family were terrified, but it got worse. Incredibly, mainstream outlets seriously tried to paint this reporter now and his news agency as the victim. As I mentioned before the hit piece was published, I put out a social media statement about this reporter stalking me and pushing to have my husband fired. The Huffington Post, the American Society of Journalists, and several other news agencies pumped out follow-up articles claiming that my original statement angered people so much to lodge threats now against the Huffington Post. People were infuriated that a reporter would dox and endanger an entire family. Now they were blaming me for somehow inciting threats against this reporter and the Huffington Post. The Southern Poverty Law Center, the SPLC, even listed my organization that has not yet been launched as a hate group. The SPLC is a prominent civil rights advocacy organization, which has long been corrupted by the radical left. The SPLC yields a lot of influence in America. And once you are listed as a hate group, American businesses use this to justify boycotts. Keep in mind, my organization has not yet been launched. Meanwhile, my family is living under security. We are receiving death threats. My parents are receiving swastikas in the mail. My family's livelihoods are being destroyed. My husband was thrust into the spotlights. For decades, he worked tirelessly to get where he was. It was all erased because they wanted to stop me. Can journalists and left-wing advocacy groups really justify attacking family members? Is there a precedent in the history of American journalism to target the employer of the spouse of a private citizen who dares to speak out against Sharia and female genital mutilation? Is this the new standard? The left likes to pretend they believe in the concept of a strong and independent woman, a woman who has her own passions and her thoughts and her own career. Yet all of these leftist media outlets targeted my husband, my father, my brother for my thoughts and my opinions. Now they push the notion that I am just an extension of the thoughts of these three men, that they should somehow all be punished for not keeping me in line. The irony is my father is apolitical. My brother is a liberal. 
and my husband disagrees with most of my politics. I am not a reflection of them. I'm a reflection of myself, a reflection of a strong and independent conservative feminist, and this is what threatened them. The left will tell you that they like to fight for LGBTQ rights, yet they turn a blind eye to the atrocities occurring under Sharia. They claim to be champions of animal rights, yet they embrace halal, one of the most barbaric, inhumane ways for an animal to die. They claim to care about women's rights, but fight against laws banning female genital mutilation in America. They claim to care about child trafficking and slavery, yet they refuse to report on the rape gang epidemic in the UK brought on by migrants. These left claim to care about our prison system, yet they are the ones fostering the prison industrial complex. Again, I am the one speaking out against anti-Semitism, LGBTQ rights, animal rights, women's rights, child trafficking, prison reform, wrongful conviction, veganism. My life has been dedicated to helping those less fortunate than myself and shining a spotlight on all injustices. Keep in mind, I am not getting paid or funded for my work. I just was a test run for the radical left. They wanted to use me as an example to show if you make too much of a difference, they will destroy you. They wanted to, the number one response I received from people around the world and activists and patriots in America was, I cannot take the risk of what is happening to you happen to my family. I cannot put our lives in danger. That meant the radicals had achieved their intended goal, to scare the people into silence. This Huffington Post reporter is the modern day brown shirt. The message is clear. If you dare to dissent from the leftist agenda, if you dare to oppose jihad terror or stand for the equality of all people against Sharia oppression, they will destroy you. The media outlet that pushed published this hit piece against me is the Huffington Post. But as I mentioned, the Huffington Post is owned by Verizon, one of the biggest companies in America. Verizon recently showed its feelings towards Jews. When you now land in Tel Aviv, Israel with a Verizon phone, you receive a phone alert from Verizon welcoming you to Palestinian territories and not to Israel. These leftists will not stand for any dissent any more than Hitler or Stalin did. If the Huffington Post was actually able to convince the public that I, a Jewish woman who champions just Jewish causes, is a Nazi, that means they are winning and they are capable of discrediting absolutely anyone. The latest leftist media onslaught in the United States proves this. Now the left has waged war against Christian children who support their president, all in an effort to let this the next generation know. If you don't fall in line with leftist beliefs, they will come for you. Children are now in the crossfire. Just yesterday, I received a note from a concerned mother. It read, I now realize that the media has convinced half the country to hate my white, conservative, Catholic-educated sons and pushes the lie they are racist simply for supporting their president. Red pro-Trump baseball hats are now being equated to the white hoods of the KKK. I grew up among predominantly Jewish people who, like my family, had some way been impacted by the Holocaust. I grew up seeing people's numbers tattooed on their arms from the Holocaust. At a young age, my parents did not shield me from how evil can permeate and destroy millions, whether it be Nazism or communism. From such a young age, I couldn't wrap my head around how something so evil could happen, how millions could be slaughtered in the Holocaust. My mother would always say that history repeats itself. I was taught when you see evil, you have a personal responsibility to call it out, to identify it, and certainly not to hide from it or be silent. I was always terrified that so many people thought that if they remained silent through the Holocaust, maybe their lives or their families' lives could be spared. It sent chills down my spine that the hijacked plane on 9-11 had a terrorist telling all of the passengers to just calm down, stay silent, and everything would be okay. The one thing that history has shown us over and over and over again, that is if you choose to stay silent, it will never be okay. The only hijacked plane that did not hit its target on 9-11 was the one where the passengers did not stay silent and instead overthrew the terrorists. This is, why today, this is why the evil of today, 
the people that are trying to destroy our countries and challenge our civilizations as we know it are doing everything in their power to silence us. We are at such a pivotal time in our history when we are starting to watch the evils that have taken place in our histories begin to repeat themselves again all over. Speaking from personal experience, I can tell you the opposition is vicious and is growing more terrifying by the day, but our voices must never be silenced. My family and I have been stalked and harassed, smeared, threatened, and have been on the receiving end of a full-on coordinated media assault by the radical left and their terrified individuals and organizations. For the past nine months, there has not been an aspect of my life or my loved ones that has not been under threat. But despite this, I have a personal responsibility to all of those who have perished at the hands of evil, who are no longer have a voice, and the promise I made to my family, I refuse to allow this evil to ever silence me. It's the responsibility of every freedom-loving moral person to eradicate evil. We cannot let them intimidate us into submission. Thank you.